You ready? Okay. Um, last time we talked about materials are only 10 to 20 percent of the cost of a large scale structure. Um, and I think I mentioned on a $20,000 automobile, there may only be $2,000 worth of materials. For example, the steel structure, I know, on a Ford Taurus, um, because uh, Professor Clark had a student who's now a professor at Harvard Business School do her thesis, a doctoral thesis, and they estimated the cost um, of the steel structure was basically about $500. That's the, what they call the body in white, the steel frame, um, which is it's a unit body construction. So, you know, the doors and the trunk lid and the, the whole passenger compartment and everything is about $500. Well, obviously, you've got to buy seats and things like that. In fact, after the engine, the most expensive part of the automobile is the seats. The seats actually cost more than the, the, the steel frame, as far as that goes. Uh, but I also said I wanted you to think about how to estimate some things um, as well. So um, this morning, I thought, uh, as, as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, okay, September 11th is coming up. People think about the World Trade Center. Um, we know there's about a, a quarter million tons of steel, or there was, in the World Trade Center, okay? So anybody know how much steel costs per ton? Structural steel? When they built the World Trade Center in the early 70s, the cost, if you put it in inflated dollars, would be about $1,000 a ton. Today, it was probably $250 a ton back then, uh, maybe $300 a ton. The cost today of that same steel is about $300 a ton. It's just as, in today's dollars, it's not inflated. Uh, in fact, the cost of steel has gone down by about a factor of three in the last 30 years uh, in, in constant dollars. Uh, but let me just say, I'll take, I'll be very generous and say that it's $500 a ton, and that means that that's $125 million for just, just by the steel. That's not erecting the steel. That's not necessarily punching the holes in the steel or, or welding it, but that's just to buy, you know, the raw material comes in from the steel plant. Uh, now, and remember, that's not all the materials in the World Trade Center. There's lots of concrete and other stuff, too. What's the value of one of the World Trade Center buildings? And how would you estimate it? Anybody have an idea? You know how, a, you know how an appraiser estimates a home? You know, if you go buy a house, it has to be appraised, so the bank will know how much they want to loan on it. You know, you can't go get a million-dollar loan on a $200,000 home, right? How's, a, how's an estimator... An appraiser estimate the value of a house. They get paid three or four hundred dollars for doing this trivial thing, yes? They compare, they have to compare with other homes in the area, so, but I mean, it's kind of hard to compare with other World Trade Centers in the area, right? But there's there are also other ways to do it. They actually go in and measure the square footage, right? And they measure the number of rooms. And they actually, they actually do it about three different ways. One, they compare the prices of all the other homes that have sold in the area that are comparable in the neighborhood. And then that's one way, and they come up with a number. Then they essentially say, well, how many rooms does this home have? You know, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms? And each room kind of has a value, and you add it up that way, and you come up with a number, and you compare it to the sales price of the other homes. But another way is to say, well, what's the replacement cost of building this building? And it turns out, if you just know the number of square feet in a building, everything else kind of averages out. You know, you got to have a bathroom, you got to have a kitchen, you know, and um, you got to have heating and things like that. So, does anybody have an idea what the cost of, per square foot of building a commercial building in Boston today is? No one's got an idea? Anybody know what the rental price per square foot of a piece of downtown property is? Well, it depends on the economy, but at the height of the economy four or five years ago, they were getting 30 to $40 a square foot. So if you get a, some nice job and you're working in downtown Chicago or something, and your office is a small office, you have to recognize that to give you that 10 by 10 office, 
which is 100 square feet, cost them uh, uh, um, $3,000 a year just to rent that one room. And then the hallways are actually you know, also renting the hallways. So anyway, you got f about $400 a square foot. It turns out the World Trade Center's got 110, 110 stories. The um, World Trade Center was about 216 feet by 216 feet square, so 208 to a, by 208. So that's about 40,000 square feet, which is about an acre per floor. But that's 4 million, or 4.4 times 10 to the 6, okay? 4.4 million, 4 .4 million square feet times 400 is 1.76 billion, okay? So that's less than 10% just for the steel. But I got to put the concrete up and the windows, glass, and everything else. And if, you know, if you start adding everything else to build the basic building, without without all the fancy woodwork and paneling and everything else, to build the basic building with drywalls and doors and stuff, you're gonna spend three, four hundred million dollars on materials to build a two two billion dollar building. Okay, and you know. Would the World Trade Center cost $1,000 a square foot? There are buildings that cost $1,000 a square foot, such as a clean room. Actually, clean rooms and some of the better clean rooms for making semiconductors might cost you two or $3,000 a square foot to construct. If you're buying a home in Austin, Texas, instead of paying $250, $300 a square foot for the home, you actually can probably get it for $100 a square foot. Why did I pick Austin, Texas? because of major cities it has the lowest housing costs in the country, um, or it did a few years ago anyway. So there's a variation on all of this stuff, but nonetheless, you ought to be able to, over time, come up with certain types of rules of thumb and, and learn how to estimate some of these things. So that's the World Trade Center um, and kind of estimating cost. Um, another thing I forgot, I didn't hand out before, I mentioned that um, it was really tedious to make things before, and I didn't show you this example. But a few years ago, I had an opportunity to go down to Boston Gas's training facility down in Norwood, Massachusetts. And they have a, a very small museum of what they've dug up under the streets of Boston over the years when they're laying uh, pipe. And actually, the, the original gas pipe um, going between the street lights and the city of Boston was nothing more than a log that had a hole drilled in it. So it was about a 10-inch diameter you know, tree trunk, and they had drilled about a one-inch hole in it, and they just kind of line up these logs and bury them in the ground, and they would pass gas that they had pr produced and that would light the street lights. And you can imagine that was not the most efficient process, but that was the best thing they had back uh, in, uh, in the 19th century. This actually is a cast iron pipe from supposedly 1836, and here's the joint, and I'll pass these around, but two cast iron pipes, and they put a sleeve around it, and then in the sleeve, they just pack in what they call the oakum, which is the same thing they used to put in, this, in between the, the wood of the Constitution, the ship, uh, the Constitution, just a mixture of rope and other minerals, or minerals and stuff that uh, kind of forms a putty-like material, and the rope uh, or fiber gives it some strength. Um, there's a, a third pipe, but anyway, there's pictures here of three different pipes that they dug up out of the city, out of the streets of Boston when they're putting in new stuff. Um, and you can imagine that stuff is not necessarily, although it's been there quite a while, is not quite as reliable as some of the things that we, we produce today. Um, then we got into, started talking about bond energy of primary bonds and how strong something really should be. Because usually when we're welding something, we want to achieve some sort of strength. And it turns out that, we pointed out, ionic covalent and metallic bonds all have something on the order of one to three electron volts per atom uh, as a bond energy. Uh, Van der Waals bonding is 10 times less. Hydrogen bonding, which some chemists kind of consider a subset of Van der Waals, a special case. Other people consider it a, um, a special case and give it its own because it's it's significantly it's about double the strength of the average of Van der Waals bond. Um, now, uh, well, I won't get into the next thing yet. Um, if I were to 
I didn't make an overhead of this, but I do have a handout. Um, if I were to try to calculate what the theoretical bond strength of a material is <clears throat> based on, or the theoretical strength of a material, I would have to essentially say, okay, I'm gonna, if I'm going to take something and break it in two, I'm going to create two new surfaces. And if I break every single one of those bonds at once, I mean, if I take a piece of chalk, a small piece of chalk, and I pull on it, I can break on it, break it. I just created two new surfaces. And I could, I know how many atoms are on each surface. And if I say, okay, I'm going to have to do an f dot dx, okay, to pull that apart. And that's going to create the energy of two new surfaces. There's a surface energy associated with, with, uh, with surfaces, and we'll get into that in a second. If I do that and calculate that, this, this handout basically tells me that what the, uh, what the strength of it's going to be. And the way you do, do all that without using that is you actually go back to what in chemistry classes they call the Leonard-Jones potential. So if I have a, a green atom here, and I go out some distance r, and I bring another green atom in towards this green atom, the energy, there will be an attractive energy, or a decrease in energy, um, as the two come together. And there will be a minimum of energy. Once the nuclei start getting too close together, you start seeing repulsion of the nuclei, and that is the repulsive force here. Or that's the repulsive energy. It goes positive here. It turns out the force is just the derivative of energy with respect to distance. You know, f dot dx is equal to energy. You know, remember that from freshman physics? Uh, so you can differentiate this Leonard-Jones potential and come up with a force, and there's a, an attractive force pulling the atom, the atoms together, and there's a neutral point where the force reaches zero, and that's where the that's the equilibrium distance of separation, which usually in, we call a zero is the inner atomic spacing. So if this is an iron atom, a green iron atom, and this is a green iron atom, they're going to have some equilibrium separation. That will be the minimum of energy. And things will actually bond because they lower their free energy, if you remember that from thermodynamics. The force of attraction is neither positive or negative at the equilibrium separation. If you try to squeeze them closer, there's a big force of repulsion. If, you, uh, if they're further apart, they will actually pull together. However, if they get far enough away, this dies down to zero, and there's not a big force of attraction. After all, an atom that's 100 atomic spaces away from another doesn't really see the other one. There's no electrostatic fields or the sharing. There's no sharing of electrons and, uh, in metallic bonding and covalent bonding and the electrostatic forces and ionic bonding are too far away because they've died off as R squared with distance. So um, you can look at this Leonard-Jones potential and you can say, well, if I equate the energy, what, what I've done on this little calculation for you is essentially the same type of calculation, although I did it a little cruder probably, then the guy that worked with Professor Smalley at Houston on the carbon nanotubes says, how strong is a carbon nanotube? No one's ever measured the strength of a carbon nanotube. After all, how could you actually grab one of those things on two ends and pull it apart? Okay, can't do that. So they calculated it. And they said, oh, these things are two or three million PSI. Well, here's the calculation. Basically, you take the energy of the bond and you take, you have to integrate f dot dx because in order to pull these apart, you have to overcome this attractive force. So you have to integrate under that curve uh, f dot dx. What's the problem? Well, you want to turn the light off? All right. Oh, close those. Actually, we probably ought to turn the light off too. Anyway, if I can remember how. Oops, wrong one. How's that? Okay. Uh, you integrate over f dot dx, and you find that in terms of the surface energy that I created, that surface energy is equal to 1.88 million PSI for two iron atoms. Um, and it doesn't really matter what you do, whether it's ionic, covalent, or metallic, you're going to predict that the theoretical strength of bulk materials, pulling them apart, just like I pulled apart this chalk, should be a couple million PSI. But in fact, it's not. Why? Some of you took material science courses, right? 
Why are things weaker? Defects, exactly. Uh, defects such as dislocations in the material, or defects such as uh, pores. This chalk, actually, if you look at it in the microscope, is very porous. And that those pores actually, and it's a brittle material, those pores actually end up significantly weakening the material. So defects in the crystal or bulk defects, uh, notches, actually an example I sometimes use. Actually, you'll see this on the videotapes next week when I'm gone. Uh, this is a piece of paper with no defects in it, and I can pull on it actually several pounds of force along the edge. I put a notch in it, a defect, and take several ounces of force because the defect weakened the material. Now, it turns out metals tend not to have such obvious defects. They tend to have dislocations. And the, in metals, the dislocations are mobile. And in fact, what happens in a metal is you're not breaking all the bonds across that whole area at once. You're only breaking one line of bonds at a time. And in fact, the um, two different people, um, Poliani and let's see in Poland, and or Egon Orowan, who later was a professor of mechanical engineering here, but he was in Hungary independently. Um, and actually, there might have been a third one in England. But in the 1830s, they predicted that crystals would have these dislocation defects. And a dislocation de defect, you have a bunch of planes of atoms. You can think of the, the you know, planes of atoms like the sheaves of a piece of paper. And a, an edge dislocation is kind of like having an extra plane of atoms that only goes halfway into the stack. So you have a dislocation where I'm missing a half plane of atoms. Um, well, it turns out that we know the story of Egon Orowan and what his in inspiration was for predicting that these crystal defects could significantly weaken the, the material. Because people had done these types of calculations like I just handed out to you, okay? And they had predicted that materials should be 10 times stronger than they really were. And they didn't understand this, and so these guys in the 1830s were, or 1930s were trying to figure this out. And what happened is Egon Orwan was in some fancy research institute or university or something, and they had, this, they had these nice Persian rugs in the office that he was in. And he was sitting there working at his desk, and uh, a cleaning woman came in, and she was cleaning up. And the rug was this old, this Persian, heavy Persian rug was slightly out of out of place, and she she mentioned she had to move it. And he says, "I'll help you." And she says, "No, I don't need any help." And all she did is she introduced a dislocation in the rug, and the dislocation consisted of nothing of nothing more than bunching up the rug as a little bend like that, at one end. And she kicked that across the room, and the paper moved, or the rug moved about six inches, OK? So the force she was using, she was using a much lower force, but a much greater distance, and got the same amount of energy input as trying to pull the rug all at once. And so that was uh, Orwan's inspiration to figure out what, what allowed metals to deform at one tenth or one twentieth the, the strength of their theoretical bond strength. Well, it turns out you can illustrate this with a telephone book. In a telephone book, if I want to rip a telephone book into, first of all, I used to do this with the yellow pages 20 years ago. That was when they did not put polymer reinforcement in the paper, OK? And the paper was nice and brittle. I can no longer do it, even with the white pages because the papers are much tougher than they used to be. Fortunately, MIT still uses cheap paper. So this is an MIT telephone book. Um, it's not as cheap as, as the other The other stuff was really great. But anyway, you introduce a dislocation, which is nothing more than bending a U in this thing, grabbing it with your thumbs. And now you can see I'm only going to stress the top fiber. Everything else has got some slack in it. And so if I do that properly, and I just bend it back. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, MIT's gotten better and better. Oh, well. Gee, I just did this this summer for another class. Okay. We basically are just ripping 
a few sheets at a time as you go through until you get that notch. Let me take the uh, hard cardboard. Pardon me? Yeah. I took the other cover off. Covers are, are a problem. But I've actually got a notch there. I'd like to make that other notch, the last notch. I'm going to have to quit doing this one. On the live, you know, it's like O.J. Simpson. You never take a bloody glove off in the courtroom. A live demonstration. But anyway, you get the notch, and hopefully you get the idea. This used to be a lot easier, but once you get it going, it's easy, right? If you get the defect started. But the point is, you start the defect one line of atoms at a time rather than a whole plane of atoms at a time. Um, gee, I'm going to have to go find the 1993 MIT phone book rather than 1998. Um, so theoretically, things should be much stronger than they really are. But in fact, they're not. Um, now, you could say, even so, well, let me, let me back up and say that if if one to three electron volts, which is kind of the bond energy of the primary bond energy, can give me two million PSI, if I actually can get without defects some bonds that are just Van der Waals bonds and have no defects, I can still have strengths of 100,000 or 200,000 PSI. Because if two electron volts is equal to two million PSI, a tenth of an electron volt ought to be equal to 100,000 PSI. So. Inherently, most materials like to bond together. There are some materials that don't bond together. If this force of attraction gets to be small enough or there is, goes negative, what happens to this agglomeration of atoms? Well, it turns into a gas, basically. Right? Um, if atoms don't want to stick together, they will they will fill up the space they have and spread out as much to, to fill the volume and uh, at whatever pressure they're at. Any condensed phases, whether they're liquids or solids, have a force of attraction. And between the individual atoms, without defects, I have a very, very high effective bonding potential in terms of strength. And the question is, how come? If I just lay something down on the table, it doesn't stick. I mean, if I've mean, got atoms in contact with atoms, right? Uh, well, the reason, there's twofold if you read chapter 16. There's two reasons. And the first reason has to do with surface contamination. If I actually look at the structure of a surface, uh, let's see, where am I? Just happened to draw a surface yesterday morning. Now I have a bunch of atoms, and each atom in this little two-dimensional crystal I've drawn has four bonds around it. One, two, three, four, around each one of these little circles. Except at the surface, the free surface, there is an unsatisfied bond at each one of the surfaces. The red represents the it doesn't really look very red, does it? Anyway. It is red. Um, these bonds on the surface don't have anything to bond to. These others are just continuation of the infinite crystal down around here. But these top bonds are not satisfied. They have not lowered their energy in the Leonard-Jones potential as much as they would like to if they had another atom adjacent to them. And so there is something that's called surface energy. And the surface energy, the surface energy is always positive. Why is it always positive? Because it's always a higher, the, the, the lack of a bond energy in a condensed phase has always got to be higher than the actual bonded state. Other things, otherwise, the thing would be a gas, not a condensed phase. So the surface energy is always a positive quantity. It create, you need to add energy to the material to create new surface, just like what I broke the, the chalk in two. Um, 
And it's possible, in fact, it's common, more common than not, that the surface, particularly if I have primary bonds, ionic, covalent, or metallic, those things have a potential of 2 million PSI strength to want to latch on to anything that's around. So if I were to create a fresh surface by breaking something in a, in a vacuum, it would absorb whatever molecules are around. So if let's say I had carbon dioxide, a carbon dioxide molecule would bond to that if this was a, a piece of metal, a metal crystal that I break in a vac ultra high vacuum and create a new surface, if there's any carbon dioxide around or any oxygen, okay, oxygen kind of looks like the same atom here, it would, it would react with that surface. And that will lower the bond energy, it will lower the surface energy by creating contamination on the surface, okay? Now, um, to, one way to prove that is to kind of tell the story about what happened on the very first Mercury space flight. So Mercury was, what, 1960? Two or something after, uh, well, Sputnik was what, 1958? Uh, the Soviets put up a, a, a dog in space and, and stuff and put up a satellite and shocked the United States because they got into a satellite in space before we did. Hey. Which this? You don't like that? Okay. So, in any case, uh, the first Mercury flights were basically out of Cape Canaveral, what now called Cape Kennedy in Florida. Um, and they didn't go in all the way into orbit. They basically just went out over the Atlantic. And they, the first one was Alan B. Shepard, um, was a Navy pilot. And he kind of just took a ride up into the stratosphere or whatever, about 100 miles up, and just took a parabolic arch and landed in the Atlantic Ocean a uh, 1,000 miles away or so. And then the. After three Mercury flights, they went into, what was the next flights? The one that, uh, who was John Glenn, was, was he our first guy to orbit the Earth? And then he became a senator from Ohio or whatever. Anyway, they, they started orbiting the Earth. Well, in some of those first flights in the early 60s, NASA found that the graphite they were using as a lubricant in space became an abrasive. And so NASA started all this study in fact, in 19, um, they started all this research on why this had occurred. And in, can I get the date here? 1967, they held a conference, which became an American Society of Testing and Materials Special Technical Publication 431, which is called adhesion or cold welding of materials in space environments. And this was all because, you know, they had these little knobs and stuff these guys were supposed to operate in the spacecraft, which worked just fine on Earth, but when they got up in space, they couldn't turn them. <laughs> they lost their controls. They didn't, NASA didn't tell the public that. But the research scientists at NASA started figure, trying to figure out what was going on. Turns out this is graphite, and you can tell this is the crystal structure of graphite because the atoms are black, right? Um, but graphite has a hexagonal crystal structure, which consists of essentially planes of atoms, close-packed planes, six um, kind of a hexagonal pattern with different planes in this direction. It turns out on Earth, a free in-plane surface of graphite in the air will absorb oxygen onto that basal plane. So if you want, they, they put these little things on here so I can stand it on the table. But in fact, if you want to consider that an oxygen atom, if this is an oxygen atom that would combine with the carbon atoms on the surface to contaminate the surface of the graphite. That lowers the surface energy. Graphite all by itself with no contamination on it has a very high bond strength. After all, carbon-carbon bonds, what's the strongest material known to, known to man? Diamond, right? Carbon-carbon bonds are not actually the strongest bonds. The strongest bonds or silicon oxygen bonds, but uh, individual bonds between the two atoms. But carbon-carbon bonds are very, very strong. They're kind of number two. And in fact, we have a lot of hydrocarbons in the world and a lot of organic compounds. A lot of you is actually composed of carbon-carbon bonds because they're very, very stable bonds. Well, that means the surface energy of carbon without any oxygen on it is very high and it will absorb whatever contaminants it can 
whether it be water vapor or oxygen or whatever, and they didn't have the tools to really measure it back in the, the 60s, today we do in the laboratory, but you basically contaminate the surface with oxygen, lower the surface energy, and that's what gives graphite its lubricity on Earth, is the contamination of the surface with oxygen. If you go up into space where there is no oxygen, it turns out the low pressure of oxygen up there, or the vacuum, yanks the oxygen off the surface and gives you carbon, bond, carbon unsatisfied bonds, which when they come in contact with another carbon particle, they bond to it. And so the graphite was no longer a lubricant, it was an abrasive in space. Uh, now one way to solve it is to use something like molybdenum disulfide in space. Molybdenum disulfide has the same crystal structure, planes, but it already has sulfur contamination or sulfur, sulfur in ligand, ligands that lowers the surface energy and it works in space just fine. Uh, I had a student once um, a number of years ago, he was working doing some welding in an argon glove box and he had a little dust buster inside the glove box in order to vacuum up things when he was doing his work. And he found that the, the carbon brushes in the dust, bus, dust buster, the motor for the dust buster, lasted for 15 minutes. Now obviously if you bought dust busters and the, the motor wore out every 15 minutes, you wouldn't buy very many dust busters. But in the absence of oxygen, you know, it was one atmosphere of pressure, but it was all argon with no oxygen, he was wearing out those brushes and in 15 minutes. He came to me and said, well what do I do? I said, rub your brushes on the new dust buster with some molybdenum disulfide and it won't have a problem. And in fact he did and then it would last 45 minutes or an hour. I mean, it wasn't quite as good, but still it was good enough for for the type of work he's doing. Actually, dust busters don't last but about three hours of real operating time anyway, if you ever owned one. <coughs> They're not exactly high quality. In any case, um, one conclusion from all this is welding is essentially the exact opposite of the, of the science of lubrication, which we don't call the science of lubrication, we call it tribology, okay? And tribology basically comes from a Greek word and it means this, the study of surfaces, okay, or interfaces. Um, it turns out that uh, we put all kinds of lubricants on things and we have a surface here and typically the lubricants, the way they often draw them is as a molecule with a circle and a tail on it. And that circle and tail would typically be things like stearates a stearate is nothing more <coughs> than a hydrocarbon. So I'm going to have some with carbon, hydrogen, a long chain carbon with hydrogens. Okay. And down here with more carbons, you have some sort of I can't remember exactly, it's some hydroxyl and another carbon or something down here. Um, this end is the, represents the circle, and this end represents the kind of squiggly line they usually draw. This is a polar end to the molecule. It has a slight charge. This is a nonpolar end, it's a symmetric molecule. Polar molecules want to bond to metal surfaces because of their slight electronic charge. And so the molecules um, will stick to the surface on the polar end and they'll leave this kind of piece of grass waving in the breeze of a nonpolar piece of grass which has a very low surface energy. And so if you um, go to uh, um, and look at lubricants, greases and stuff, a lot of times they'll contain stearates or uh, palmates, which come from palm oil, or uh, anyway, there's a whole series of these depending on the number of, of carbons in the chain. Stearates are, are commonly used as lubricants. I can't remember. I think stearates may be 18 carbons in that chain, or 16, I can't remember, something like that. Um, you know a little bit about stearates. Anybody know what else has stearates in it that you use, most of you use every day? Pardon me? Detergents or soap. Do you use dial? No. Um, the, when you take a bath, you're, you're actually using calcium stearate. The active ingredient is calcium stearate. In fact, the way it relieves the dirt 
is if you have a dirt particle, the stearate, essentially the polar part of the stearate, bonds to the dirt particle and essentially lowers the surface energy and it washes away and dissolves and washes away in the water. Except if you come from a place that has hard water. Anybody been live somewhere where they had hard water? What's, what's in hard water that makes it make you feel like you're still slimy no, matter, no longer? No matter how long you stand under the shower, you still feel like you got soap on your skin. Anybody know? It's calcium. Cal calcium, essentially, in the soil, if you come from an area where the, uh, the water comes from the groundwater and there's a lot of limestone around, it'll be saturated with calcium or magnesium. And the calcium, since it's a calcium stearate, and there's a calcium atom down here in this, in this little tail, uh, the calcium, if there's already calcium in the, in the water, the calcium stearate doesn't want to dissolve in the water. And it will form a little film on your skin, and you can rinse in water all day long. If it's hard water, it won't dissolve away. It's already saturated. The water's already saturated with calcium, and you can't dissolve away uh, the calcium. We don't have that problem in Boston. Why? Because our water comes from river and lakes, which basically is fairly fresh rainwater. And the fairly fresh rainwater doesn't have, is not saturated with calcium. It's groundwater that's been sitting there for thousands of years and got saturated with the limestone in the soil that creates a problem. But as you travel around the country, I can always tell when I go in a, a new city and take a shower, whether they got hard water or soft, soft water, depending on whether I can get rid of the slime when I shower, right? Now you can put water softeners in your water, but the problem with that is it corrodes everything. Uh, soft water is very corrosive. In any case, um, so that's surface energy. Well, what are the typical values of surface energy? This is from your handout, and you don't really have to read it too much, but if I, actually, I guess we can read it. It's not too bad. Typical surface energy of something that's ionically bo bonded. Well, this, um, what's ionically bonded here? Well, we got sodium sulfate, sodium, well, we got sodium chloride crystal, which has a surface energy at 25 degrees centigrade of 300. We've got sodium sulfate, which has got 200. And sodium phosphate is 200. Uh, so an ionically bonded solid, uh, what else is ionically bonded? Calcium fluoride, 450. Uh, calcium carbonate is pri primarily ionic. Lithium fluoride certainly is, 340. Somewhere in the 200 to 400 ergs per square centimeter. By the way, ergs per square centimeter, um, 1,000 ergs per square centimeter equals one joule per square meter equals one newton per meter. Um, in any case, um, the surface energy of an ionic solid, and I can go back here to, maybe I'll write this in, in on these, <coughs> is going to be on the order of 200 to 300, or 200 to 400, let's say. Okay. If I look at this thing and say, well, what's going on here with something that's covalently bonded? What's covalently bonded? Aluminum oxide is around 6,700. Um, what else covalently bonded on? Barium oxide, whoops, oh, that's down around 80. Uh, um, what else is covalently bonded? Um, well, this, this is a silicate type of glass around 400. In any case, covalently bonded materials, this, this one doesn't have silicon, but you have another handout is also in the order of, let's say, 200 to 500 in most cases. Metallic bonding, on the other hand, if you look at this, what's metallic bonded? Well, metallic bonded, copper is 1430, silver is 920, um, solid silver is 1140, platinum is 1865. So it turns out, if I look at all this, metal surfaces are something on the order of 1,000 to 2,000 ergs per square centimeter. What's uh, hydrogen bonding? 
Well, what's hydrogen bonded? It's water, and if you didn't notice on there, it was the top one, it was 72 ergs per square centimeter. And if something is Van der Waals bonding, it's going to be even lower. The surface energy is directly related to the strength of the bonds. Well, if these are all primary bonds and these are all one to three electron volts, how come metals are two or three or four times as great as the other primary bonds? Well, anybody have an idea? Think about metals. Uh, in an ionic bond, it turns out, we'll use this one down here. An ionic bond, it's really the two atoms that are closest to each other that interact. One's positive, one's negative. It's uh, electrostatic attraction. A covalent bond, it's basically those same two atoms, and they're sharing electrons rather than transferring electrons. But what happens to the outer electrons, the bonding electrons in a metal? Where are they located? They're located, they're shared among a bunch of atoms, right? So it turns out, if I'm talking about an ionic or covalent solid, the bond energy really only comes from the top one or two layers of atoms. Because atoms further away, you can't even see them. The electron transfer is only on the order of one or two atoms, maximum. In a metal, though, there are atoms way down here that are going to have their electron unsatisfied up here on the surface part of the time. So in fact, a metal surface is much thicker, if you will, than a covalent or ionic surface. There are more unsatisfied electrons because there are more nuclei that have electrons that are not completely satisfied. And so metals tend to have a much higher surface energy than ionic or covalent solids. You can say, well, so what? What does this have to do with welding joining? Well, it has to do with the fact that most of the bonding processes that we're going to talk about before we get to fusion welding are all controlled by surface energy. Okay? It turns out that the, uh, the strength of these bonds, of these materials, is going to be controlled by surface energy. It turns out that contamination on the surface is more difficult to control in metals than any, any other material because they have the highest surface energy. They have the strongest attraction for these contaminants. It turns out that the amount of time that you have actually I can do it here, before you get a contamination of the surface is given by a number we call the Langmuir. And Langmuir was, I don't remember he was the first Nobel laureate in, in uh, chemistry you know, in the United States or whatever. But anyway, he was a scientist at General Electric around the turn of the century, last century. Um, and uh, he studied surfaces. And a lot of things in surface physics or in chemistry are named after Irving, Irving Langmuir at General Electric. But the Langmuir is 10 to the minus 8 atmosphere seconds. It, you know, some people say it's three times 10 to the minus eight. What is the Langmuir? The Langmuir is the amount of time at, at, at a given pressure that the kinetic theory of gases says it will take to have one monolayer of atoms strike the surface. So if I break this chalk and create a brand new surface, and I'm at one atmosphere pressure, the number of gas molecules that will hit that surface in 10 to the minus 8 seconds at one atmosphere will be sufficient to completely cover the surface if all of them stick. Now, in surface physics, they like to talk about sticking coefficient because some of those atoms, particularly if they were inert atoms like argon or helium, will just bounce off the surface. Okay, But if it's a carbon dioxide or a water molecule, it's liable to stick to a nice fresh surface with a high surface energy. Okay? So if I break this chalk, and I want to bond it back together before it gets contaminated. I got ten. I got something less than ten to the minus eight seconds. I got to be real quick when I do that. Okay. Um, so it turns out that you got to go to very very high vacuums in order to study this. And if you go back to the good old NASA handbook on cold welding in space, they had. And you have a copy of this, which is definitely going to be a little bit harder to read. This comes from that same STP in 1967. But what we've got here is, this is, you'll see on the top here is altitude in hundreds of thousands of feet and a log scale going from zero to 
uh, three million square feet, or th no, three million feet above uh, sea level, that's the apogee of Sputnik 1. That's why this is on here, right? The pressure in Tor, well, here's one atmosphere of pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury, uh, one atmosphere. Inches of mercury pressure are a vacuum. This is 29.5, so that's, that's down here. Microns, if you ever worked with vi vacuum pumps, sometimes they talk about how many microns of pressure the vacuum pump will go to. So here's 10 microns or one micron. That's a typical mechanical pump. If you've ever worked with diffusion pumps, you know, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 is good pressure. Um, if you've ever worked with turbo molecular pumps, you might get down to 10 to the minus 8. If you've ever really worked with ultra high vacuums where we use sputtering and other things, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10. If you go into um, uh, inter, inter, uh, uh, interplanetary space, you might be at 10 to the minus 11 in the vacuum. That's between, you know, Mars and Jupiter. If you want to go into Interstellar space, you might be at 10 to the minus 12. If you go to intergalactic space, you might be at 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 14 in terms of the vacuum. People have produced something on the order of 10 to the minus 12 and for very limited times on Earth in a vacuum system. But if I now go back to my Langmuir, I got to be, if I wanted to do an experiment in the laboratory, and create two brand new surfaces and see if they stick together, if I put them back together with any strength, I've got to be in an ultra high vacuum at 10 to the minus 9 or 10 to the minus 10 in order to have somewhere between 10 and 100 seconds to pull them apart and put them back together. And people have done that. People have taken gold surfaces, which they cleave by special techniques, in an ultra high vacuum, and they pull them apart in an ultra high vacuum, and they stick them back together, and they cold weld with about one third of the original strength. Okay, pretty impressive, right? How come it's only one third? Well, it's only one third is because the second problem, contamination, is the first reason things don't weld. The second reason things don't weld is surface roughness. I don't care how smooth this table looks; if you look at it in a microscope, it looks rough. If you're looking at an atomic scale, there are very few things that we, we can produce on Earth that are smooth on a, an atomic scale. It turns out that if I take two pieces of gold and I cleave them, even in an ultra high vacuum, I end up with two rough surfaces. And if I don't put them back with perfect registry, which is on an atomic scale, impossible, right? I end up with only about one third area of contact which is why I only get about one-third area of the strength. I'll actually prove that to you later, uh, why you get one-third. But in fact, people have measured it. So it is in fact true that if I, just, if I start out with just two atoms and take the Leonard-Jones potential and bring them together and say, what should their strength be? I can take iron whiskers and I can prove the strength really is two million PSI if there's no defects, right? If there's defects, I got my telephone book problem and I'm gonna have one-tenth that strength. If I actually pull things apart like the chalk and try to put it back together, it doesn't stick. Why? Because it got contaminated. If I do it in an ultra-high vacuum and stick it back together, I can get one-third the strength, but because of surface roughness, I can't get all the strength back. So the two fundamental things in adhesive bonding, cold welding, diffusion bonding, soldering, brazing, all these things, the two fundamental problems are surface contamination and surface roughness. And any welding and joining process I use, including arc welding and laser welding and stuff, has to overcome those two problems in some way. And it turns out people have, lots of people have tried to categorize all the different welding processes in the world. And if I can find <clears throat> uh, the last thing I'll put up, if I can find it quickly. Where you go? Is an overhead. Oh, here it is. This oh, this is also in your handouts. This actually comes from a book called Welding Process Technology by the guy who is now actually he's probably retired now, Peter Holcroft, uh, who was head of research at the British Welding Institute, and he tried to categorize a bunch of different welding uh, processes from cold pressure welding, which is cold welding, would use pressure. And he 
he categorized it in terms of sources of heat and sources of shielding. Well, shielding is a way to keep the surface contamination off. And a source of heat is a way, in general, to cause these things, these surfaces, these rough surfaces, to come together. What, in many cases, you take care of the rough surface by just interposing a liquid, because a liquid can flow and fill the gaps in between, right? If I got two mountain peaks sticking together, I put a liquid in between, it can fill in all the valleys, right? So putting a liquid in between, which is what I do in adhesive bonding, it's what I do in soldering, it's what I do in brazing, it's what I do in fusion welding. I get rid of the rough surfaces by using a liquid. In cold pressure welding, when I forge things together, I'm using pressure to try to squeeze those rough surfaces into flat surfaces. In any case, I have to use shielding gas or a vacuum or a flux or something to keep the surface from being contaminated. Because if I just do it in air, Langmuir only gives me 10 to minus 8 seconds or less to do it, to get rid of the, to, to avoid the contamination. So I actually can kind of take Holcroft's little way of trying to categorize all these processes and say, all he's really plotting is contamination versus surface roughness. That's not the way he explained it. That's why I explained what he wrote. Okay, I'll see you uh, tomorrow. <laughs>